Great, okay, well thank you very much. I think it was uh, very fortuitous that the organizers picked this afternoon to give the presentation uh, because I, give to, I <coughs> get to give some good news that two hours ago we got the final email that the gastric papers formally <coughs> accepted at <coughs> Nature, so, um, so that means, uh, so. Actually, had it been the opposite, it would have not been fun to give this talk. But anyway, um, yeah, uh, so let's see, how do I do this? Perfect, okay, so this is the, this is the most important slide of the talk, which is uh, to thank all the people involved in this project. We had a w wonderful group of people, both uh, from the TCJ side, but also the huge group of uh, TCJ volunteers, people the, uh, who were involved in this project, uh, despite lack of um, the funding and so forth uh, that uh, really made this work. And so moving on, uh, it's a little bit of background. So uh, stomach cancer is a bad problem. Stomach cancer is one of the top three causes of cancer death across the world, killing over 600, or sorry, over 700,000 people uh, every year. Now there's two main categories, or actually well, it's more than two main categories, but from the eye of the, the pathologist, there are typically two main uh, groups that ca gastric cancer is sorted into, the intestinal type tumors and the <coughs> diffuse type tumors. And uh, this will be important for some of what we'll talk about later uh, here, but the intestinal type tumors are a more typical adenocarcinoma. They grow in glands um, and they have more of the uh, you know, classic uh, cancer associated <coughs> cancer genome features, the diffuse type tumors uh, in some ways resemble the lobular type breast cancers that we heard about earlier. Uh, they have um, a CH1 alterations that grow very invasively and they lack co cohesion, um, except, uh, but compared to the lobular breast, they have a much worse um, <coughs> survival. Now this is one way of thinking about gastric cancer, but actually uh, within gastric cancer is a big problem that there's a lot of different ways to think about gastric cancer. I mentioned that the two forms of histology, intestinal cancers and diffuse cancers, people are also argue a lot about cancers in different part of the anatomy of the stomach. Are tumors at the gastroesophageal junction different than those of the body or the pylorus? People argue, are the gastric cancers in Asia different than those in the, in the, in, in the West? Are the, you know, then you have the MSI and the, you know, uh, MSS, the RB2s, you had all these different different kind of ways to think about gastric cancer, but uh, importantly, when it comes time to actually thinking about how to take care of patients and how to do clinical trials, you know, all of this gets ignored. And essentially, if you were to listen to a clinical trial or someone talking about how to treat gastric cancer, they would say, we did a trial of X drug in patients with, with gastric cancer, and they wouldn't talk about any of these kind of <coughs> variables, and so invariably then, the next sentence would be, we did a trial and it didn't work because of course you did a trial in a very heterogeneous group of patients um, and often without even thinking about a biomarker and the trial was sort of doomed to fail from the beginning. And so with that as um, um, prelude, we wanted to think about this, uh, what our goals were with this project. Um, now unlike many TCJ projects that were sort of drilling down on a particular subtype, this project really embraced gastric cancer fully. And with that, our goals were to see if we could come up with a better way to classify these, these, um, these cancers. Not only have, try to classify them, but try to do it in a way that's uh, relatively clinically applicable, you know, that doesn't involve, you know, a million dollar workup. Uh, to uh, put someone in a uh, in the category. And then as we do that, can we try to identify some of the key pathways that are active in different uh, classes of these tumors? And then within those different classes, can we find candidate <coughs> targets and biomarkers that can be a foundation for, for further therapy? Um, oops, this slide always gets messed up, so let's skip that. Um, so then, uh, uh, as we uh, aim to have this as our goal, uh, there's a, a couple ways to do that. You know, one would be to say, okay, we have some prior ideas about gastric cancer. We're gonna divide them by intestinal and diffuse, for example, and then we're gonna use that as, our, as how we're gonna, you know, organize the paper. Um, but we decided rather than doing that, let's say let's follow the results of the data. We have all these data, let's see how the data self-organize and then try to, you know, from there, figure out how we're gonna move forward with this uh, analysis. And so uh, what we did then was use two different forms of uh, classification. One was the cluster of clusters that we uh, talked about or heard about earlier, and the other was iCluster. So these were two ways of seeing how the data organize. 
But then following doing that, the goal was then to, for us to try to identify some key features that mark the different classes of gastric cancer and then use those key features then to uh, create a way to classify the cancers in a more <coughs> simple um, <coughs> method. And so basically so we would sort of use you know, the, the total <coughs> data to find out how the data self-organize, find key features that go with different classes of tumors, and then use those <coughs> simple features to make a simple um, way to classify the tumors moving forward. And so the goal then is we would use a classification that could be more easily applied towards people in real life. And so this is the first way that we went about doing this, the cluster of <coughs> cluster assignments. I think this is, should be a pointer, yep. And so when we did this, I mean the key result here, I don't want to go into all of the <coughs> details, but the key result that as you started doing this, you found four clear groups. You know, one group was dominated by tumors that were MSI positive. One had mostly <coughs> diffuse type tumors. One was dominated by the tumors that were positive for the EBV Epstein-Barr virus, and one had tumors with really wild and wacky copy number profile <coughs> profiles. And again, when we use the I cluster approach, here we had uh, five groups, but it largely recapitulated uh, what we saw previously. So I'll just zoom in a little bit here. So this first group here were dominated by the <coughs> diffuse type tumors. This is Lauren, so Lauren <coughs> diffuse in black. Again, we had a group of tumors that were mostly EBV positive. We had these two groups here that were very similar that had a lot of aneuploidy. And then again, over here, we had a group of tumors where the um, MSI positive tumors <coughs> uh, sort of formed their own <coughs> cluster. And so seeing as that these were some of the features that really marked these different classes of gastric cancer, we decided to use this as a way to uh, form our, um, our categories moving forward. So after all of this, we then reclassified the tumors by this <coughs> simple metric. So first we had our 295 tumors, and we pulled off the EBV positive tumors. Then what was left, we pulled out all the MSI positive tumors. And then with the 205 left, we separated those into the aneuploid or the chromosomally unstable. And this last group here, which was <coughs> genomically stable tumors, m basically meaning ones that lacked EBV, lacked MSI, and lacked aneuploidy. Um, so what we called, um, that more had the uh, more, more flat um, profiles. Now, as we did this, this was not independent of how we thought about gastric cancer <coughs> previously. So just looking at hi histology first, uh, the most striking feature was that the uh, <coughs> diffuse type tumors were overwhelmingly present in this group here, these uh, <coughs> genomically stable tumors, um, but it wasn't absolute. So there were tumors that of the <coughs> diffuse histology in EBV, MSI, and in the aneuploid group. And not only that, there also was clear <coughs> differences in the spectrum ac across um, a <coughs> anatomy. So if you go in the <coughs> GE junction, you get many more aneuploid tumors. As you get towards the <coughs> pylorus, you get more um, MSI and uh, <coughs> diffuse or stable tumors. In the middle of the stomach, you get more <coughs> EBV. Okay, so <coughs> does this help? Does it matter? Um, let's give an example here uh, in the EBV positive tumors. So what made EBV positive tumors their own group um, was mostly driven by the strong <coughs> methylation <coughs> differences. This is a sort of a agnostic <coughs> methylation <coughs> clustering uh, led by um, <coughs> uh, Toshi and Hui. And when, they, and when this was done, what's seen is that the EBV positive tumors formed their own uh, separate group, which are distinct from the hypermethylation seen in the classic SIMP or MSI tumors. And these uh, um, MSI tumors largely have silencing of MLH1, but none of the EBV SIMPs have that. And so this helps, uh, helps us define this as a distinct group. And so do we learn things from that information? So the answer is, uh, is yes. So for example, for some time it's been known that a certain percent, 10, 15% of uh, gastric cancers have activating mutations of PI3 kinase. But by, by uh, creating this way of categorizing these tumors, we see things we hadn't seen before, such as the fact that the, uh, EB, the EBV tumors have an overwhelming percent of mutations of the <coughs> PI3 kinase. Actually, overall 80% of them have PI3 kinase mutations with roughly 70% being at sites that are cosmic sites or recurrent sites. Whereas you go along to the SIN tumors, it's down to 3%. So that's something that hadn't been previously noted. Now also we could try to find new events, not just um, learn more about the events we already knew about, like PI3 kinase. 
So within our copy number analysis, for example, we saw an intriguing novel peak that was on chromosome 9, which we initially attributed to the gene JAK2, because JAK2 is a <coughs> tyrosine kinase, and so, you know, it's an amplified kinase that makes a lot of sense. Um, well, it's uh, quite um, intriguing, though, is when we looked at the different subgroups, that this novel JAK2 event was uh, very enriched in the EBV positive tumors present in 15 percent of that group, stronger than even the, um, the aneuploid tumors, where the other events were much more um, enriched. Now, we drilled down a bit more into the genes here, and so on, as you zoom into this little piece of chromosome 9, again, you see JAK2. But there are also other genes in this event. A couple of them have uh, rather unassuming names, such as CD274 and PDCL1LG2, the kind of names that you usually <laughs> ignore in a list because the names are so boring. Um, but uh, when you look, these actually have quite exciting names, not for the gene, but for the, <coughs> the protein, because these uh, genes encode for PDL1 and PDL2. So these are very well known. Uh, proteins now, which are um, immunomodulatory proteins expressed by a number of cancer cells as a, mean of a means of down-regulating the um, anti-tumor uh, immune response, and these are um, uh, targets of a number of new uh, emerging inhibitors. And when we go into the expression data, we could see that actually the EBV positive tumors have higher expression of both PDL1 and PDL2, with a subset having true outlier <coughs> profiles being the cases that are, um, that are um, the ones that have the 9P um, the amplicons. And also within our gene expression, we could see that the, actually the EBV tumors have a strong immune um, present um, <coughs> signature, which uh, goes along with our knowledge that EBV positive tumors have a strong immune cell infiltrate. And so now if you can see from the sort of forming this idea that EBV positive tumors are their own group, we've now found two very strong <coughs> therapeutic targets to <coughs> take forward in, this, in these tumors, both in inhibiting the PI3 kinase pathway as well as now bringing these novel uh, <coughs> PD-1 and <coughs> PD-L1, PD-L2 in inhibitors into this um, class of <coughs> tumors. Okay, so those are the EBV positive tumors, but that's 10% uh, of gastric cancer. You know, 10% of gastric cancer is still 70,000 people dying every year, but uh, what else can we say about the other groups? So just quickly, if we go into the um, aneuploid type groups, the, 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 uh, the SIN tumors, uh, what's very striking is that all of the amplified targets that are present, you know, recurrent amplifications at EGFR, ERB2, ERB3, you know, FGFR2, MET, and so forth, a number of targetable alterations, and of these, only right now ERB2 is currently being um, used in, in clinical practice. So a number of new opportunities there to bring forward other biomarker-driven therapies. Now, the MSI tumors, as you would expect, have a lot more mutations, less copy number aberrations. And here we uh, scored these mutations by gene, with the key point being that dark green is where you have mutations present that are cosmic sites, and light green are non-cosmic sites, because you could also have a lot of passengers, these hypermutated tumors. And a lot of these mutations are actually hotspot events. For example, recurrent mutations of uh, ERB2, you know, we have uh, a number that are S. 310F that have been shown as being activated uh, by <coughs> Matthew's group, also recurrent hotspot events such as ERB3, V104M. These are recurrent hotspot activating, musent, activating mutations shown to be <coughs> drug sensitive that are present here that aren't being acted upon right now. Okay, but last we have this one group here, the <coughs> genomically stable group. Uh, or largely <coughs> diffuse type cancers. So these are really nasty cancers, really <coughs> bad actors. And as you see from this view here, looking at the PI3 kinase and RTK pathways, it seems a bit quiet. There's not as much else there compared to the, the other classes. Um, and so here's where we turn to trying to find uh, novel events, looking at our analysis from MUTSIG from this cohort. This is just looking at, looking at the non-hypermutated tumors here, separated out by the EBVs, the uh, stable and the uh, SIN tumors, seeing things you'd expect like P53 heavily in the SIN, CDH1 heavily in diffuse, PI3 kinase heavily in EBV, as I mentioned, as well as ARD1A. But one novel event that we honed in on were these new mutations of row A that were enriched in the <coughs> diffuse type group. So if you look at these events, they have the pattern that look exciting. They're highly <coughs> clustered events at row A <coughs> GTPA <coughs> signaling protein, including five mutations at uh, codon uh, <coughs> tyrosine 42. 
Um, so these two domains here, where, or two areas where you have frequent mutations, are two uh, parts of the protein that lie right next to each other in the effector area. So Rho is a GTP-bound protein. When it's bound to GTP, like a RAS protein, is active. And this is the area here where you signal to downstream effectors, such as ROC1 um, here. And again, so these were heavily enriched in the diffuse type tumors or the genomically stable tumors here, so 15% of this cohort. So uh, Rho A is an, a gene that's involved in, uh, it's, it's signaling is important for uh, organizing the, the actin in the cytoskeleton, enhancing invasion and migration. So again, these were present in diffuse type gastric cancer. This is a class of tumor whose hallmark feature is that it grows in a way that's not co cohesive and the cells are highly invasive. So this makes a lot of sense te teleologically. Now, this pathway also came up from our analysis of candidate fusion genes. And so both from overlapping the, um, the low-pass whole genomes and the RNA-seq, well, what came up very intriguingly were a number of alterations linking these genes together, cloud and 18 on chromosome 3, and uh, uh, RGAP26 on uh, chromosome 5. And these, all of these fusions involve bringing uh, the, 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 the RGAP protein onto the UTR of uh, cloud 18 This is a really small target, like a little 2 kb target. Now you have a situation here where you have a fusion gene that hits the, the UTR. So right here you have a stop codon. So when we saw this, we said, okay, well actually you're not gonna get a mature fusion transcript because you have a stop codon here. But uh, the work led by Andy Mungle and Rian Bowlby uh, d with the transcripts figured out something quite cool. And that was that you actually have an ability here to activate a cryptic splice site where the uh, splice site from exon 12 of the second gene goes into exon 5 of the Claudin 18, finds a cryptic splice site, splices out the last uh, 30 nucleotides of this protein, including the stop, and creates an in-frame fusion. And so overall, we had, uh, I think, 13 of these events across our, um, our, our, our group of samples. And the resulting protein, and I'll, I'll get into what this would be doing in a second, uh, links together this Claudin transmembrane protein, and at the very end of it, uh, hitches on the C-terminal portion of this rho gap protein, a ARH gap 26. And what was quite intriguing was just like the Rho-A fusions, these novel fusion proteins were highly enriched in the same group of tumors, the diffuse type class of cancers. So both of them were present in 15%, and it was a non-overlapping group of tumors. So these new um, events were basically um, uh, 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 present in one-third of this uh, class of uh, very deadly and common cancers. So um, what are some of these genes? What, what could they be? So Cloudin 18 is a part of the tight junction. This is a cellular adhesion complex. So tight junctions are actually what they would sound like, actually uh, uh, basically in an epithelial lining, help to sort of rivet cells to together. Now RGAP26 is a rho gap protein. A rho gap means a GTPase activating protein. This was the kind of protein that would act to reduce rho A activity, which of course poses a question here as we imagine that these alterations would be activating this pathway. Um, but that then again, so you do have this, this novel protein here where you're lopping on a part of this rho gap domain to um, this um, adhesion protein, so you're, you know, you, the, the, the potential for this to be dysregulating this pathway both by modulating the location of the gap as well as its um, function is, is, is uh, quite large. Um, but to summarize, what we've, what we've gone from is a situation where you have gastric cancer um, without a, a good way to think about it in terms of uh, to how to classify it or how to take care of it to this new system now where we have four rationally defined and robust classes of cancer where we have some clear salient features for each one. We have the aneuploid type tumors uh, you know, with a lot of PP3 mutation, a lot of RAS and RTK alterations. We now clearly define EBV as its own subtype with actionable alterations such as PI3 kinase mutations and the overexpression of PDL1, PDL2. Um, 
we have the MSI tumors that are highly mutated and have SIMP, and we found a number of you know, actionable mutations in this group. And in the genomically stable tumors, we don't have as many simple, obvious targets, but we have a number of uh, new in insights, including this very intriguing novel mutations of Rho A and this new um, fusion, really helping us think about a novel pathway in this class of cancer. And so with that, I want to once again thank all the people who were involved in this project and uh, thank all of you for your time. Yeah, sorry, wonderful talk, really, very, very nice. So the, the question is, uh, do we know anything about H. pylori yeah. in these cases? And what's the any clinical outcome association with those four groups? And for example, whether each some group is more sensitive to chemotherapy? Um, so we don't, well, to, to, to answer your uh, question, so in terms of H. pylori, we don't have very good annotation for that because unlike EBV, the H. pylori doesn't really, doesn't get into the cancer cells and it's more on the l luminal surface. So we, 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 we weren't able to quantify that with <coughs> genomic data uh, to the same extent. Um, in terms of clinical outcome, the survival data are still coming in. At the little data we have so far, um, there's not big survival differences, but that's not surprising because, you know, survival in gastric cancer is just sort of like bad and worse, you know, um, so there's, um, and we, we don't know yet about, we don't have data on sort of chemotherapy responses because there's so many different source sites and so much variability in the chemotherapy given. We don't, we don't have that level yeah, of data. If you go to the data. MSI, you would think that may be more sensitive to chemotherapy. Possibly, possibly, you know, in a MSI colon is thought to be less responsive to adjuvant chemotherapy, so it's not, you know. Uh, congratulations, Adam. Beautiful. Um, in, in light of these GE junction tumors where pathologists struggle, yeah. are there any insights you think you can be gained from sort of merging some of the, your stomach data with some of the esophagus data oh. that I know you're working on and sort of analyzing those in, in the broader context? Someone would think you were a plant in the audience. Um, so, um, uh, so, um, so I'll say that, you know, it, it, you're, it's, it, you know, it is a little bit arbitrary with these GE junctions, whether people get called stomach or esophageal, and because of history, with the stomach project starting first, all of the GE junctions were included in that bucket, but we're actually merging for our next phase the esophagus and stomach working groups to try to look at these jointly. So as we move to the esophagus, we're gonna really try to ask the question, you know, real tubular esophagus versus GE junction and, and, and so forth, are they different? And so I think that's a, a key question moving forward as we move to the next phase here. Okay, let's move on to our second speaker. It's uh, Ari Hakimi, who will uh, talk about the integrated analysis of metastatic disease and clear cell renal cell carcinoma.